Yes, um, if you're uh, having a sense of deja vu, we have had micro talks at the Institute before um, for our innovation initiatives. But this is the first time that we've had a micro talk event specifically for new faculty. And we've organized this event because new faculty have asked us for it. In the fall, we went out and we talked to new faculty and we said, what are your needs? How, how can we serve you as an institute? And one of the things that people kept asking us for is we would like an opportunity to showcase our work on campus. We would like more opportunities for collaboration across campus. And so we thought, why not? And um, so we issued the invitations and uh, just about everybody said yes. I mean, we have between today and Wednesday, we have 21 faculty in their first and second years in the Car College of Arts and Sciences <coughs> presenting on their work, which I, I think is, is just wonderful. So, so let's get started. Um, our first speaker is Brandon Bain from the Department of Religious Studies, and the title of his talk is Christian Martyrdom and the Colonization of the Americas. Okay, hi, everybody. Um, so I came here in August from Fordham University, and I just read a quip from the president of Fordham University yesterday that I want to share to kick off. Uh, he is a Jesuit, Father Joseph McShane, and commenting on the recent election of a Jesuit pope from Latin America, he said this, a humble Jesuit is an oxymoron. A Jesuit pope is an impossibility. A humble Jesuit pope from Latin America, a miracle. And uh, that's kind of an in, a bit of inside baseball joke for the Jesuits uh, because they're not known as being that humble. And you'll get a sense of this here in my presentation. They are an order that had sort of global ambitions uh, from the 1540s and their founding, the initial vision of Ignatius Loyola to at the time of their expulsion from uh, many parts of Europe and the Americas in the 1750s and 60s. Uh, they truly were one of the first global enterprises um, in the early modern period. So what I'd like to do is uh, just kind of tell you in the five minutes that I have um, the basics of what I do using a device that I often encourage my students to use when they look at historical documents, which is to tell me the who, what, when, where, and why. Tell me the five W's of what you're looking at. So for me, the who, as I told you, are already Jesuit missionaries. Uh, <clears throat> but the other side of that equation are the indigenous groups that these missionaries encountered. The what. Uh, are specifically the practices of evangelization and the sort of spatial reduction of indigenous groups into Spanish settlements. Uh, I'm also looking specifically at accounts of martyrdom or suffering and the way that that discourse played out for the Jesuits as they thought about their uh, mission. Uh, another answer to the what question are the sort of sources that I use. I look at natural histories, uh, letters between the Jesuits and two superiors, uh, reports from government officials, maps, and you see a couple of these maps and pieces of artwork that also uh, give us an insight into the Jesuit understanding of their mission. The when is really, uh, in my dissertation I had a very broad scope looking at sort of the arrival of the Jesuits, the 1570s and 80s in um, Mexico, northern, in New Spain, all the way up to the time of their expulsion, which in New Spain was 1767. Uh, the where, I've already kind of mentioned, uh, is New Spain or uh, Mexico, what we think of today largely as Mexico, although New Spain transcended that, the viceroyalty of New Spain. Uh, but specific, specifically, and you can see this in the map, I'm looking at the northern frontier of New Spain, and I know it's actually, you have to really bear down to see this, but if you see there on the left, Mar de la California, the Gulf of California there, this is the northwestern edge of Mexico, Sonora, Mexico, Baja California and what today we call Arizona, and the, the top little line there is actually the Gila River, and you see Coco Maricopa, or the land of the, the Mar Maricopas today, Maricopa County, Phoenix, Arizona, so just to kind of give you a sense. Now, <clears throat> the why is basically, uh, what I mean by why is why does this matter, so what, what's the big idea? And what I look at are <laughs> discourses of victimization as a way of kind of making sense of violence and justifying the colonial process. And what I argue is that Christian notions of martyrdom serve to kind of elide or sometimes uh, obfuscate the material causes of indigenous rebellions, uh, disease, death amongst indigenous communities, but also 
why the missionaries weren't being successful, actually why they weren't converting, and they used the discourse of martyrdom to sort of understand themselves as still succeeding despite the setbacks, still having victory despite uh, being victims. Uh, in the time left, I just want to kind of give you a few little visual illustrations of what I'm talking about. So that first map there is a picture of a Jesuit missionary, 33 years old, Father Javier Saeta, who was killed in 1695 in Caborca, Sonora. Uh, and what you have there is an illustration by fellow missionary, Eusebio Quino, who's kind of known as the explorer and founder in some ways of Arizona today. Uh, who illustrated the death of his companion and actually put the knees on top of two indigenous towns, uh, Caborca and Pitiquito, which were uh, the, <coughs> the groups that lived there were Pima or Atam, a uh, specific group of Atam known as the Sobas. Now down, the second illustration that you have here is actually a piece of artwork that came to, into the hands of Mexican, um, Mexican government during the time of the expulsion. I don't know who the painter is, but it illustrates the ambition that I sort of talked about at the beginning, uh, this global ambition with, in this case, Jesuit martyrs dying on every continent or at the hands of every type of uh, group, whether a Middle Eastern in the center of the page, African on the right, or in the back, uh, indigenous people from the Americas. And that image actually is a mirror image, I, I would argue, of the image above of Saita being killed at the hands of indigenous people. The last two images that I placed there, just to give you a sense, <clears throat> is a painting from a church in Colonial Peru, in Lima, Peru, that also illustrates this sort of global ambition. And you have all the different sort of continents uh, represented there at the bottom, and the different uh, indigenous peoples of the world looking up to St. Ignatius Loyola there in the center, Francis Xavier uh, on the right, uh, as, as those who will lead indigenous people to uh, heaven. And then finally there on the right, you see an illustration that comes from Miguel Vinegas's Noticia de la California, his history of Baja California, which he wrote in 1737, uh, but was only published in 1757. And you see there an illustration of part of what I uh, work on, which is this sort of mapping of martyrdom onto the colonial frontier, in this case, an illustration again of Baja California and northwestern Mexico, the southwest of the U.S., with sort of common pictures from natural histories, um, indigenous healers, uh, different fauna and animals. But there at the bottom, on the left and right, two Jesuit martyrs who literally uh, kind of claimed that territory with their blood, is what the Jesuits would say. They sanctified it with their blood. Nicolas uh, Tamaral on the left and Lorenzo Carranco on the right. And so this is... This gives you a, a little sense of uh, what I'm working with, the sort of sources, and the way that I'm trying to build my argument. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Brandon. And, um, and now I'd like to invite Towns Middleton uh, from the Department of Anthropology. And um, because my program has disappeared, I'm going to have you tell us the title of your talk. OK. OK, thanks to Maria and everyone at the IEH for getting us all together today. Um, I thought I would take the few minutes I have to tell you a little bit about, about myself and what I do. Uh, I think the first thing to tell you is that within the field of sociocultural anthropology, I'm probably best defined as a political anthropologist, which to me means I'm very interested in how life informs politics and how politics in turn impacts life. Um, I take these issues up in Darjeeling, India, which is right up here in the foothills of the Himalayas. Um, you may know of Darjeeling because of its world famous tea, or perhaps you've heard of its stunning Himalayan vistas. And indeed, these two reasons are why Darjeeling has become one of the primary tourist destinations in India. Um, but if you were to go to Darjeeling, or you were planning to go to Darjeeling sometime in the next month, you might not actually get there. Or if you did get there, you might not be able to leave when you wanted to. And that's because there's currently a sub-nationalist agitation going on in Darjeeling for a separate state of Gorkhaland. And I'll return to this movement in a moment. That's really where my direction, the direction of my research is headed right now. First of all, though, let me tell you a little bit about the people that live in Darjeeling. They're collectively known as the Gorkhas, which should not be confused with what we often think of as the Gurkha mercenaries that worked for the British Indian Army. Um, 
In 1835, the British came up to Darjeeling and realized that this would be an ideal hill station, or what they called a sanatorium. It was cold, it was wet, just like the motherland, and they realized that they could possibly make a place where they could kind of get away from the proverbial heat of empire. The problem was is that, as you see, these hills are very steep and they're very jungly, and to make Darjeeling into a hill station, and then later as a primary tea growing area, they would need massive amounts of labor, and they simply didn't have it from the local population. So they started recruiting labor from Nepal, and people from Nepal, different ethnic groups, started coming over by the tens of thousands. <coughs> by the end of the 19th century, we're looking at over 100,000 immigrants there. And these groups of all different ethnicities, like the Sherpas, the Gurungs, they came to be known as the collective Gorkhas. Now, since they arrived to India, they were marginalized severely. They were often thought of, as, even to this day, as outsiders, as foreigners, uh, sometimes referred to as chinkies, which is a racial epithet in, in India. And because of this, they've harbored long-standing anxieties about belonging in India. And in my work, I've called these anxieties anxious belonging, and they're important because they charge contemporary politics with great affective energy. Now, these anxieties came to a head in the 1980s when the Gorkhaland National Liberation Front launched a violent movement for a separate state of Gorkhaland. Now, importantly, they were not trying to secede from India. They were actually trying to get their own state within the Indian Union. The idea here was that if the Gorkhas had their own state, then they would be recognized as an authentic part of, of India. After three years of violence, though, the agitation failed to deliver a separate state. Something very peculiar happened in its wake, and this is really where my research comes into the picture. The people that, the different communities that formed the Gorkha conglomerate began pursuing alternative routes to rights and recognition within India. And these they found in India's massive affirmative action system. Primarily, it's what is called scheduled tribes. Uh, becoming an officially recognized scheduled tribe would give these communities uh, very lucrative entitlements and various <coughs> rights and forms of representation in India. Now, political parties picked up on the fact that if enough of Darjeeling's population became recognized as scheduled tribes, then the whole region itself would become eligible to become a tribal area and thus win constitutionally guaranteed autonomy. So by about 2005, which is really when I was getting started with my research, becoming tribal was truly the order of the day. So what I tried to do in my field work was work with the different political parties, with the different ethnic associations, and also the <coughs> everyday people who are part of these movements so to understand how this, these politics, this tribal turn, if you will, was affecting life. Now, I got very lucky during the course of my field work, and I also got to know and work with some of the government anthropologists who go around certifying India's scheduled tribes. So working both sides of, politics, of the politics of recognition, I tried to understand what was going on from the side of the aspiring tribes and also the government anthropologists who recognized them. One of the things that I became increasingly fascinated with during this work, though, was the ways in which these communities were actually turning to academic anthropology in order to figure out what it meant to be a proper tribe so they could represent and literally sometimes remake themselves in the proper image of the tribe. So, on the one hand, my work is very much about indigenous rights and indigenous movements and also multicultural governance, but my, also, my work is also very much about how people are t taking up and often taking on disciplinary paradigms for new, for new uses. Um, so what I'm trying to argue in my current book project, which I'm working under the title as Beyond Recognition, really what we're seeing these days with these communities taking up anthropology for their own purposes is just the latest chapter of an ever-evolving legacy of the discipline in the subcontinent. Um, I've got two minutes, so let me tell you where I'm headed from here. Um, when I mentioned that if you had gone to Darjeeling sometime the next month, that you wouldn't necessarily be able to leave or possibly even get there, that's because there's currently another Gorkland agitation, much like the one that happened in the 1980s. Um, as it turns out, these movements for tribal recognition and autonomy weren't as successful as the Gorkhas had wanted. And there was a massive political upheaval in 2008 where a new liberation front emerged and put Gorkland back on the table. Um, so assassinations, indefinite strikes, and sporadic violence have really become the hallmark of this ad hoc insurgency. So what I'm trying to do for my second project is situate myself within these throes of agitation to think ethnographically about kind of the effective and subjective and social dimensions of uh, the political contemporary in Darjeeling. And what I'm hoping to do here is to be able to theorize more generally about the volatility of life and politics, not just in Darjeeling, but also beyond. So that's kind of in a nutshell what I've been doing and what I'm up to. Thank you very much, Towns.
And next um, is Christian Lenz in the Department of Geography, and his um, talk is titled, Where is Dien Bien Phu? Decolonization and the Politics of Asia's National Frontiers. Well, thank you all. I want to thank, in addition to the audience, for taking time out of a, what Maria aptly identified as a very calm, peaceful time of year. I'd like to thank Maria for organizing, Brian for his assistance, as well as Towns for encouraging me to participate today. So this first slide should orient you just a little bit, but I don't want to go over the top here. This is a hill <coughs> looking west towards contemporary Laos. And this is the Great Dien Bien Phu Plain, um, which is about 20 kilometers by five kilometers wide. And it's very unusual in Mount Montaigne, Southeast Asia, for uh, providing an environmental condition suitable for wet rice agriculture. So let me just talk briefly about my broader project and who I am before I get into the title of today's talk. So I'm in geography at UNC, which I think provides a really good institutional home disciplinarily. Um, and in the University of Four, my interest in Southeast Asia and what I call the long 20th century, from the age of high imperialism and into our contemporary age of global or neoliberal restructuring. And I embrace a historical geography to study uh, the ways in which Southeast Asian social formations and agrarian peoples conceive of themselves, and further, how these conceptions vary across space and time uh, in relation to local resource struggles and their connections with broader social processes. My book manuscript, which I'm tentatively entitling uh, Placing Dien Bien Phu, Oppositional Politics and Vietnamese State Formation, um, is a focus, focuses really on the 1950s. When this out of the way place called Dien Bien Phu earned global renown as the site where the People's Army of Vietnam defeated the French Expeditionary Forces in May 1954 and precipitated the collapse not only of Indochina, that is Vietnam, Laos, and uh, Cambodia today, but of French empire on a global scale. In the midst of Algeria's struggle with France, for example, Franz Fanon reflected on the battle's impact on negotiations in Geneva, July 1954, when he wrote in 1961, not a single colonized individual could ever again doubt the possibility of a Dien Bien Phu. I'm interested less in the military struggle um, and armed combat than in the underlying social processes of state formation and nationalism and their entanglement and contests over agrarian resources. And I'm going to return to some of the questions I'm asking in a moment. But in this micro history from below, or what I call a micro history from below, I draw on Vietnamese and French language archival records, oral histories, and ethnographic fieldwork to situate Dien Bien Phu as place and event in broader spatial and temporal contexts. So this brings me to today, today's talk and title. So what are the dimensions of this broader context I just mentioned? Where is Dien Bien Phu, or rather, where was Dien Bien Phu? How do we locate a heavily contested place in relation took the collapse of European empire and associated categories of knowing socially different peoples and places. In terms of how we know Dien Bien Phu's local peoples and their stories, to what degree do categories of Vietnamese nationalism reproduce historiographic slippages, problems, more often associated with colonialism, such as the elisions, silences, and forgetting we associate with colonial histories. This map's legend, for example, shows a telos, as well as the national we taken for granted, and the violence deeply embedded in spatial categories. So in the remaining time, um, I know this is a quick run through things, I want to suggest that taking seriously what is a very simple question opens up alternatives and possibilities too often neglected in dominant historical narratives. Di mana l'etat dien bien fu posed by the Chinese, or where is Dien Bien Phu? It's a question, simple question, posed by the Chinese Indonesian scholar and activist, Dr. Ui Hong Lee, in 1961. Returning from the Geneva negotiations in 1954, he took it on himself to report back to, in Indonesian to his Indonesian audience and show how Dien Bien, and locate Dien Bien Phu in Asia, near the People's Republic of China, what he considered a regional giant, some, a place he admired for supporting national liberation struggles and enacting an anti-colonial solidarity. Note how he does not locate Dien Bien Phu in Southeast Asia, 
a spatial construct he associated with the morally corrupt Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, or CETO, founded by John Foster Dulles in September 1954 as a regional bulwark against an alleged communist expansion. He speaks to the promise, I think, that international non-alignment held for newly independent nations across Asia and Africa, something celebrated at Bandung in 1955. So answering his question means pausing and thinking cautiously before locating the site in Vietnam or in Southeast Asia. First, there's a practical problem. Geneva, partition, Geneva Accords partitioned Vietnam into two Vietnams. Moreover, I want to handle with care what C. Wright Mills called in 1955 a, quote, military definition of reality in relation to spatial constructs at multiple scales, be they local, national, or regional. So I apply this to my writing, for example, by revisiting, uh, by resisting easy place names and finding alternatives. So I consider the people and place of Dien Bien Phu as part of the Black River region, a borderlands at the corner of modern day China, Laos, and Vietnam. And I argue that remembering an epic showdown between generals and soldiers actively forgets the everyday struggles of hundreds of thousands of farmers, laborers, and conscripts working behind the scenes. So this leads up to, this leads me to agrarian questions or agrarian studies in agrarian relations of land, labor, capital, and capital I think of in terms of opium, it's a very large opium producing part of the world, and to ask questions about the transformation of these relations across forms of rule. Why did local peoples participate, or not, in anti-colonial struggle? On what terms were they recognized as members of a Vietnamese nation? And in what ways did national liberation fail to secure legitimacy, yet nonetheless inform and inspire a search for alternatives. So how did local peoples imagine a just polity, and what were its spatial dimensions? So in sum, the place of Dien Bien Phu highlights how the Democratic Republic of Vietnam was both a global beacon of hope for colonized peoples and a national political project beset with internal contradictions. So my approach lets me turn Franz Fanon's assertion into a question. In the diverse and dynamic spaces where empires fell, what was the possibility of a Dien Bien Phu? Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Next, we will hear from Kumi Silva of the Department of Communication Studies on He Loves Me Not, Race and Patriarchy in the Global Circulation of Romance. I feel like I should make some kind of remark about the irony of somebody from communication studies without technology. Um, so I'm, I'm actually just going to talk. Um, and thank you, Maria and Brian, for organizing this. This is wonderful, and I'm very happy to be here. And thank you all for being here. Um, so I want to start off by just saying, kind of positioning myself as a um, cultural cartographer. That's what I call myself. Um, and that's just a really fancy way of saying that I have many interests and that um, I try to find a fancy word to come up to describe it and legitimize my academic existence. Um, but the essence is that I'm really interested in uh, mapping relationships. I'm interested in how not just personal relationships, but um, our relationships to cultural products and politics and material objects all come together to create particular identities. Um, I am theoretically influenced by post-colonial theory, feminist theory, critical race theory, and cultural studies. And it's within this intersection that my new book project is uh, positioned. And it's on global romance, and Harley Quinn, and Mills and Boons. And it's very fun um, to read these after a very, very long time. Um, so to kind of give you an idea, I'm going to kind of talk briefly about the three areas that I'm bringing together. Um, and the first is that I grew up reading Harley Quinn romances. I read my first Mills and Boons when I was 11. Um, I was uh, not allowed to read Mills and Boons, but I still borrowed. My sister is four years older than me, thank God. Um, and she had Mills and Boons, and I was able to read it and um, love them. And then I turned 18 and came to college, and um, I didn't end up marrying a sheikh in a, or being part of a harem. My hair did not turned red, uh, or I did not get full lips and a pert nose. None of these things happened. 
Um, so I recovered from my love affair with males and boons, but I kept going back to Sri Lanka, which is where I'm originally from, and I realized that there was still very much uh, context for these books, that, um, that people still really loved them, that my uh, <coughs> peer group still read them. And one of the things that really interested me was the fact that um, unlike the way we think about Mills and Boons <coughs> and Harley Quinn romances in the United States, that um, the books in Sri Lanka were very much couched in a sense of privilege um, and a, a kind of a form of um, a class hierarchy that I was very interested in. First of all, they were in English um, and they were circulated amongst a group of people who were very cosmopolitan <coughs> um, and who were professionals and these were uh, women in their late, between like 28 and 45. Um, and uh, that was very interesting to me. The second aspect of it was that all of the books were being, in, within Sri Lanka, were being circulated uh, through a, a series of secondhand book shows, uh, bookshops that had opened up um, in an industrial park in Colombo, in a suburb of Colombo. And it was these really interesting um, stores that were run by men um, who were not of, and who were working class, blue collar uh, workers. Um, and the, when I say it's an, it's, I, and I wish I kind of had, I should have brought technology. Um, but um, there, it's an industrial suburb where, um, it's called Maradana, and it's the part where um, you go to buy car parts. And it's a very geographically, a very, and culturally and socially, a very masculine space. And within this are these booksellers selling romance novels. And uh, these, you know, these ladies are much um, uh, of a different class and who are educated and wealthy, drive up in their Mercedes and their BMWs and um, are recommended books by these booksellers. And um, I, you know, I was interested in that aspect of those social relationships. So that's one aspect that makes up the book. The second aspect is that when I started um, doing research on the project. Um, Mil I re uh, Mills and Boons was bought, Mills and Boons is no longer located in Britain, it was bought up by Harley Quinn, which is located in Canada. Though they still have uh, corporate headquarters in London as well. Um, and um, I was, wow, time goes by very fast uh, when you're talking about yourself. Um, but one of the things that really interested me was that um, these, what, what Harley Quinn had done was that they had decided that it was in South Asia that they had the largest distribution of their books. And they, for the first time ever in July 2012, opened a publishing house in India that translated the <coughs> books directly to uh, Tamil, Malayalam, and Hindi. And all they did was change the names and the locations, but they kept the plot line exactly the same. So it's this, for me, these are all very interesting things. So um, I'm trying to talk very fast. Um, so basically the book brings together my interest in all of these areas because I think they're, um, one of the uh, aspects of it is that there, there's the aspect of production, <coughs> which is why you choose to produce particular books for particular audiences and where. Um, and I'm looking at India and Sri Lanka uh, specifically because um, I am interested in how post-colonial um, kind of conditions create this desire for these books and a desire for um, a kind of uh, what I call like a white fantasy um, and because of this chronic colonialism which is part of that region. Um, and um, I'm also really interested in translation and what goes into translation and what it means to have these books translated um, into Tamil and Hindi and Malayalam and uh, what the expectations are. So all of these things come together under my interest in the transnational circulation of romance. Thank you. Thank you, Kumi. Um, Klaus Laris uh, from the Department of History will speak on enlightened self-interest, the U.S. and the <coughs> unity of Europe, past and present. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. 
I'm in history and I'm also associated with PWAD, the Peace, War and Defense curriculum. I've been here since January 2012 and it's still great. <laughs> and when the weather is so nice as it is today, then of course uh, it's much more pleasant than uh, to being an island where you used to teach before, where it's always rainy and great. Um, I would like to talk about my current book project. It's called Enlightened Self-Interest, the United States and the Unity of Europe from Truman to Obama. And of course, that is a very timely project at the moment due to the Euro crisis. So thank you, Wall Street. Thank you, Greece. It really made my life a lot easier. <laughs> What the project is all about is that I'm looking at the uh, point of view of the United States, how they have viewed that European integration process, which really began since the Marshall Plan of 1947-1948. And the first phase, the late 40s throughout the 1950s, bits of the 1960s, I would call that is the golden period, where the United States was fully enthusiastic about European integration and where there was also kind of sort of transatlantic harmony. At least the Americans and the Europeans didn't argue too much. That all changed by the late 1960s, early 1970s, and I call that the turning point. And that has, was due to the Vietnam War, it was due to America's declining uh, economic performance, and it was also due to European increased confidence because their economies were doing well, they were counted a little bit more on the world stage, that gave them a boost of confidence. Um, we saw serious economic differences between the transatlantic allies and the Nixon administration's lack of confidence in the European allies. And the Nixon administration by 1972 was severely worried about its re-election because it was doing economically very poorly. So the Nixon administration wanted to do everything possible to get the economy going again. And that was the beginning really of the influence of Milton Friedman, of neoliberalism and of trying to get rid of the Bretton Woods system of, of fixed exchange rates. The Europeans being more traditional, more cautious still, as we can see today when you look at Germany and austerity and all that, um, that was still the policy in the early 1970s. They didn't think a, a, an awful lot about Milton Friedman. They wanted to keep the fixed uh, system of exchange rates. In the end, the Nixon administration had its way because the superpower, of course, was still at uh, 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 was still stronger and Bretton Woods was abolished. But ever since, the confidence in the transatlantic or of America into its European allies really vanished. And that crisis of confidence in transatlantic relations then characterized the, 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 the remaining years of the Cold War. Ronald Reagan, for example, was not too impressed by his European allies either. It changed again with the end of the Cold War when Bush Sr. wanted to integrate the really unified Germany and the new Eastern European nations, the liberated Eastern European nations, again into the process of European integration. So that earlier enthusiasm for European integration sort of came back by 1989-1990. Perhaps not to the same extent, but to a significant extent. Then Clinton came to power. Clinton was worried about the Maastricht Treaty, rising economic uh, uh, competition from the Europeans. Also the, 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 the rumors the Europeans were about to set up an independent NATO, a European NATO, kicking the Americans essentially out of Western Europe. So again, tension. Then we had uh, Bush, uh, Bush Jr., uh, George W. Bush, the Iraq War, severe uh, differences between the transatlantic ally, uh, uh, allies. And again, so in the 1990s, we saw severe difficulties between the transatlantic, uh, transatlantic uh, allies and that enthusiasm for European integration, which had characterized in the 1950s and 89-90, really vanished again. In comes Obama. And Obama, as you know, is a pragmatist. He's not a pro-European ideologue. He is someone who is interested in the Asian pivot. So during his first term, we would say he neglected Europe. At least that was a European perception. Also, the Euro crisis made Obama not very confident in the influence and power and strength of uh, the Western Europeans in particular. That, I believe, now has changed again in his second term because suddenly Obama realizes that it's still the Western Europeans or all of the Europeans 
who we really can rely upon in the last resort. If there ever there is a global crisis, in the last resort, it is still the Europeans you can call upon, be it Afghanistan, be it Iraq, be it how to get out of the global economic crisis, how to confront North Korea or China or Russia. It is in the last resort uh, still the Western Europeans. And I think the appointment of John Kerry as new Secretary of State indicates uh, that Europe counts a little bit more than it did during Obama's first term. Kerry is a more traditional uh, foreign policy expert and his first trip did not go to Asia, but it took him to Western Europe, much to the relief of the, of the Europeans. Therefore, in conclusion, one can say that old enthusiasm for European integration has not been revived, but it is still there to some extent. And I think the United States appreciate the old transatlantic alliance much more than they did only a few years ago under George W. Bush, for example. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Um, next, we will hear from Kathy Perkins um, from the Department of Dramatic Art. And her talk is titled, Tasuba Institute for Arts and Culture, the Gem on the Indian Ocean. Good afternoon. Um, a little background on myself. Um, my background is um, in lighting design. I'm a designer by profession. I've been designing lights for about 30 some years professionally. And I've also taught, before I came here a year and a half ago, I, uh, had the, I headed the, lighting, the MFA lighting program at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. Um, my, I call myself a practicing scholar. Um, I'm working right now on an article and a short documentary on this particular school called Tasuba. I call it the gem on the Indian Ocean because there's nothing like this that exists in Africa. And I first heard about the school from a small article that was in the New York Times in 1995 where it talked about this school being the only school of its kind in Africa. It's a institute for arts and culture and it offers a three-year diploma in music fine arts, dance, lighting, audio, scenery, costume, and most recently, digital media. And I think I said lighting. Um, it, like I said, it's the only school of its kind in sub-Sahara Africa. And the school was founded in 1981 as a way to preserve the tradition, cultural traditions of Tanzanian people. Uh, when it started out, they only brought in about 10 to 15 students a year, and the government paid all the funding for the students. Over the years, because Tanzania is having a really severe economic problem, students are having to pay for the schooling themselves. And it's becoming a little bit more expensive, but they're also allowing more people to come in to the school. What you're looking at, this is one of the uh, sculptures done by a student. Uh, my first trip to Bagamoya was in 2001, and I've been there about six times since then. I've made a huge investment in the school because one of the things I'm interested in is helping to develop technical theater programs uh, throughout the continent. I know Africa is a big continent. So I've been to a lot of uh, colleges um, and community theaters on the continent. But like I said, my big investment right now is in Tasuba. And this is just to give you an idea of where the school is. This is the map of Africa, Tanzania. And in Bagamoya is the, uh, where the school is located. It's a very small fishing town. Bagamoya is also, um, important because it was a major slave trading post. I hate to use that term, but it was where enslaved Africans were brought from the interior to Bagamore. They were held there sort of as a holding place until they were taken to Zanzibar to be dispersed throughout um, the Arab world and then later Europe. Um, and these are images of, of some of the slave holding posts. Um, this is the school. Right now, the school does not have a lot of resources, but I'm just amazed at the phenomenal talent that the students have there. Um, a lot of the funding has come from the Swedes and the, uh, the Dutch. Uh, the Swedes built this particular building. It is the only proscenium theater in Tanzania. I think it's the only proscenium stage on, in East Africa. But this is one of their spaces, uh, proscenium space. People sit outside. On the other side is another proscenium space. And uh, keeping with African tradition, there are no fixed seats. Uh, you know, it's, uh, people just sit, they bring their chairs or whatever. Here the students were rehearsing. Actually, I was there this time last month. Um, this space, the Swedes have given them lighting equipment. They don't have enough lighting equipment there. So that's one of the things I'm helping, hoping that they can get soon. Um, and this is just where the audience is in the theater. 
Um, they have a, a space, a rehearsal space, uh, also donated by the Swedes. Uh, this space is also used for rental space so they can help get um, funding to keep the school going. Well, like I say, the uh, resources, they don't have a lot of resources. You can see by one of the classrooms. Um, this is the art school here. Again, they do incredible work, but they just don't have the resources. Uh, this is where I interviewed the art instructor, and he was talking about the space. But the work that the students do are just incredible. Uh, this was a project that the graduating class uh, design this elephant is made out of concrete and a series of other uh, materials. This is the president of the late Julius uh, Niera. Um, uh, you'll see many pictures of him around. He was a very loved president. Uh, this is my pride and joy. Uh, 11 years ago, this young man who is from Tanzania, he uh, finished my MFA lighting program and now he's heading the lighting program at Tasuba. So I'm very, very happy about that. Um, and this is one of the teachers there. She's been here since, been there since 1981. Uh, in 2011, while I was still at University of Illinois, I took uh, some colleagues and some students over. We did a series of workshops here with the students where I just did a lighting workshop. Oh, go back. Uh, lighting workshop with some students. Uh, this is a colleague of mine. She was doing a playwriting workshop. Uh, another colleague of mine, he was doing a video production workshop and a grad student of mine, she was doing a stage management workshop. So they need certain skills. Um, so that's one of the things I'm really working on. Uh, like I said, I've made a big investment in this school. I want to write an article. I want to do a short video. I was there just last month uh, taping uh, students, faculty, doing the history of the school with the intent of publishing this in one of the uh, technical theater articles, uh, journals, and then doing a short video so I can send to major theater technical uh, companies with the hope that they will donate some equipment. Unfortunately, they're doing, they don't have enough resources, like I said. They have a computer lab with three of the original iMacs, if you can see them here, if you remember what they look like. Um, and they have about 50 students trying to learn Photoshop, digital media, animation, and you name it, they, they have it there. But like I said, the talent is phenomenal they are just in need of resources, and that's one of the things I would like to do. And these are some of the proud students from Tsuba. Um, but the work there is just great, and like I said, that's one of my goals is to help move this school into the 21st century in terms of resources, and if it means bringing students here to study, to go back, uh, that's what I would love to see, to see happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Juan Alamo of the Department of Music will speak to us on cross-cultural communication through music. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Brian, for the opportunity. Thank you, everybody. How are you all doing? Hi. Good. Uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about what I do. Uh, just to be more specific, I am a percussionist. I'm one of those noisy people, so if I start making sounds, it's just a bad habit of me. Um, so I'm recently, uh, I've been exposed to a lot of music as a percussionist. You get to study and teach a lot of different instruments. Uh, like today, I start teaching uh, my first class, like vibraphone and jazz, and then the next class, I was teaching something completely different about European uh, music. Then the last class, I was teaching someone how to play funk and rock and roll. So I, I go through this, you know, every day of my life, basically. Exposed to different cultures, exposed to different music. Um, and uh, more recently, I've been very much interested in, in writing music that somehow express who I am and um, the things that I've been exposed to as a musician and how can I combine all these different cultures that I've been exposed to through my music. So I'm, Currently work, working on a new uh, recording uh, of mine. Most of the music uh, was written uh, by myself, for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Just because that's the only way I could actually express what I want to express. It's really hard to get someone to uh, write something for you that express who you are. I think music is a reflection of who we are, 
or what I am as an artist. And the best way for me to express that is through my music. So I've been writing more often in, uh, in the past three, four years, uh, more than writing, improvising a lot. And uh, what I'm trying to do through my music and my improvisation, like I said before, is combine all these different cultural influences that I've been exposed to. And um, I recently wrote a piece. I was invited last summer to South America to do a two-week uh, residence in Chile at the university. And I, you know, I said, well, I, I got to come up with a piece that I could sort of represent all this different music that I love and that I like to play and teach. And at the same time, I can have other people playing with me uh, this music. So I wrote a piece. The piece is actually based on an old Mexican um, tune uh, by, by a very well-known Mexican pianist and composer, Consuelo Velázquez. The name of the tune is Besame Mucho. I'm sure that a lot of you have heard that tune. It's an old tune was written in 1940, and it's been recorded by the Beatles and everybody. Um, and um, I've played that tune probably all my life, all my musical career. The reason I came across that tune again is because I was uh, requested by this uh, doctor in Dallas, I was living in Dallas at the time, to do a concert for uh, uh, some people from Mexico who were visiting him, and he specifically requested me to uh, play that tune. So I played that tune, and after that it kind of stayed in my head and I just couldn't get out of my head that melody. And I started improvising and, and, and changing the, the melodies and changing stuff. And little by little, I noticed that I kept drawing from all this influence. So I, I used a lot of uh, European uh, techniques and, and musical devices. But I also used music from Brazil. You will hear a little bit of that. I also i am very much uh, in love with the music of uh, Spain. But especially flamenco music with all that hand clapping and that footstep that they use. Uh, to me, that's uh, very cool, very uh, uh, amazing. I also love Brazilian music. And of course, I was born in Puerto Rico, so there's a lot of Latin influence in, in my music. So uh, what I did with the piece, the title of the piece is Unforgettable Memories of an Unforgettable Love. It's a long piece. Unfortunately, I won't be able to play the entire piece. It's like a 10-minute piece. You can go to YouTube, Google my name, and then you can see the, the entire version. But this is a, a short clip. I will play like a minute and a half or two minutes. Yeah. Um, about the middle of the piece. Uh, here you will see that uh, flamenco influence. Then I go into a more Brazilian uh, type of uh, rhythm. And on the top of that, I'm using some jazz harmony. So it's a combination of a Mexican melody with uh, flamenco music, Brazilian and all these different elements that I'm bringing together in my composition. And more or less, this is kind of the backbone of, of my, my new uh, recording project, combining all these different uh, music styles and, and different cultures. So with any further introduction, here's my piece. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity.
Thank you so much, Juan. I, I was actually hoping you'd bring the marimba in, but I guess that <laughs> presented some challenges, uh, maybe another time. So um, next, um, Tawan Fan will speak from the Department of Economics on Economics of Revolution. I also sing that song. <laughs> Thank you, Maria, for inviting me. Uh, so this is our ongoing work on economics of revolution. And I came across this quote by Abba uh, Kamu uh, that I like a lot. What is a rebel? A rebel is a person who says no. So what we're studying here uh, is that we're researching economies in rebellion. And the rebelling against the corrupt tyrants. And so in the first project, we are building an economic model of, of a rebellion, of revolution. We ask particularly, why do people rebel? And why do you see such different outcomes of revolutions, ranging from peaceful application, largely, largely peaceful application in Egypt and Tunisia, to all the way to civil wars in Libya and Syria? So that's the first project. And so in, so in the process of building the model, of the, all our economic story, well, we use the following factors that are the popular factors that lead up to revolutions in history. Uh, first, the countries that are ruled by corrupt elites. For example, uh, anecdotally, Mubarak has accumulated through uh, his three decades of rule about $70, $70 billion in, uh, in personal wealth. Uh, so that's an example of, cor of corruption. And cor uh, not surprisingly, if your country is ruled by corrupt elites, you're going to have bad macroeconomics. In particular, we look at two manifestations of bad macroeconomics. First is very high youth and unemployment. The Arab world has the highest rate of unemployment and also the highest rate of youth unemployment among all the regions in the world. Another factor we don't have the time to talk about today is high prices, inflation, in particular, uh, increase in food prices. Uh, not to surprise, so you see in the Arab world, the revolutions follow a very high peak in food prices. I'll show you later on a graph. Combined with these uh, economic forces, uh, demographic, demographic force. Look at the, the Arab world, it's very young, the median age, so 50% of people are young, uh, younger than 30. Actually, Yemen, 50% of people are younger than 18. Uh, combined with that is uh, surprising. A lot uh, is very high increase in education in this region. Actually, if you look at the, the, the top 20 countries that have increased the most in terms of mean years of schooling, eight Arab countries rank there. So, and, and why does education matter in revolutions? Uh, it's a long uh, literature showing that the more educated you are, the more politically active you will be. May, um, we don't have time to dig into it. So we combine all these forces, and we lead to uh, build a very simple model that leads to endogenous revolutions, where we will have different outcome of rebellions. We will have uh, no change, that's we, the most popular example we use in Saudi Arabia. Uh, all we have, applications that are largely peaceful, so the, 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 the autocrat advocates, the Egypt, uh, Tunisia, or Yemen. Oh, and all we have also have civil wars, full-blown bloodshed, as the case of Libya and Syria. So just, I like pictures, so i show you <laughs> a graph of how, what our, our, our story looks like. A model could predict different cases where it will be civil war application or status quo. And we will test our star, our, our model, the dry part, we'll test our model using actually data from, uh, we do some regressions, and the soft part, the, the fun part is actually doing case studies. We look at how we, how we use our model as a way to understand Libyans, uh, sorry, uh, Egypt, Tunisia, and Yemen, Olivia and uh, Syria and, and Saudi Arabia. So that is the first project. I, I try to understand uh, revolutions. So, and this is the second project. So what happens after revolutions? You see now in, on the streets of Egypt, protests are going on and the economy plunged. So many people are skeptical. So what's going to happen? So we see the revolution turned to nothing. Well, this, we look at the past. So I'll give an example of of uh, the people power revolution in the uh, 1980s in the Philippines. So they were under the dictatorship of Marcos. And then the people rose up in 1983 and revolted. And you see, this, so on the top is the GDP economic output, a popular measure of welfare, uh, imperfect of course. Uh, you see the revolution associated with uh, recession there. And even bigger, better, better, bigger, uh, better picture, we look at economic growth. 
So you see the this period of revolution associated very deep recession, much deeper, by the way, than the Asian crisis in 1997. So uh, revolutions in because the Philippines hurts in the short run, but it's and but it seems the country seems to recover afterwards. Uh, but this is only one country, so how do we do it for the whole history? So what we do is that uh, we, we collect samples of 109 revolutions from the 60s to today. And we do some, apply some standard economic technique. And we show that in terms of democratization, re revolution actually tends to hurt in the short run. You see uh, GDP growth deep uh, uh, after revolution. But then it uh, jump back and jump back to a higher level. So it gets worse in before it gets better. That's our, it, uh, by the way, this is very preliminary work. So uh, we're still having to, to, to strengthen the result. <coughs> this is our approach. And in, to explain this story, we actually built, thank you for taking the picture. I can send it to you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we can actually, we built an economic model for this. And so again, it's a nice story, uh, simple story where we, we have a country that was growing in, through town here uh, under corrupt dictatorship, so it's growing with high corruption. Uh, we then enter a phase of revolution and unrest, so the country becomes a follow a very volatile period, and then it will eventually escape into a higher growth path. So this is our, our takeaway story. And the last project I want to share with you in the last minute is this new one, a very new an early, very early project on climate change and revolution that's joined to work with uh, Rick uh, Colacito from uh, Kina uh, Fleckler here in finance. We are looking at a new way to measure economic costs of climate change. We, uh, so climate change will increase the likelihood of extreme weather events. This is from the report of uh, Intergovern Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, extreme weather events, meaning you know, uh, heat waves, uh, coastal flooding, and so on. That will increase political and economic instability. So we are measuring this arrow right here. And to give you a quick snapshot, uh, as promised, you see, uh, see on, the, on the black line is the global food prices. Uh, as you see, the, the food price in the world get to the high peaks in 2008 and in 2000, uh, 2010 and 11, you see a series of unrest around the world. That is one channel how climate change hurt, uh, will, will increase the food prices and therefore will increase political and economic instability around the world. And my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Tuan, very much. Iqbal Sivia from the Department of History will speak, uh, give a talk entitled From Bards to Jesters, Caste and Religious Transmission in Modern Punjab. Hi, um, I'm going to be speaking today about, um, very briefly, about my new research project, which is essentially about folklore, oral traditions, and proverbs in modern Punjab which Punjab being the state, uh, which is the best way to describe it is perhaps it's split between India and Pakistan. It's in the northwest of, of India. Um, my previous research project was on intra-Islamic debates about the adaptability of new modern conceptions of religion and political ideologies with Islam. And once I completed that, I was itching to actually move away from studying theology uh, or theological debates or intellectual debates towards how religion is practiced in very complex ways um, in the region that I was most fascinated with, which is Punjab, which I incidentally tend to come from. But um, I was also, if truth be told, looking for something a little more fun to sink my teeth into as well. And I was also, if I'm totally honest, looking for some sort of academic or professional legitimacy to do things that I really like, which are spend the afternoons listening to folk Punjabi music, spend the evenings drinking excessive amounts of alcohol, in Punjabi villages. So this kind of project really helps me situate myself very well there. But one way I'm trying to tackle this new topic is to look at how religious, uh, sorry, how folklore, um, oral traditions were transmitted um, in one Punjab. And I'm particularly interested in the non-textual traditions of transmission. And here, when I was look, trying to peel away at um, these non-textual traditions, one term kept coming up. Uh, a term that I was familiar with when I was growing up, but I hadn't paid too much of attention to it. And this is a term called merasis. 
This is a term that suddenly appears in 19th century to classify groups of individuals who are essentially hereditary genealogists, singers, performers of hagiography, but also transmitters of religious traditions. And this term evolves and blank, blank, um, it's a bracket term that's used to um, identify this entire large community of these people. But what particularly fascinates me is when you look at colonial records or if you speak to Punjabis in contemporary uh, Punjab, what you find is Mirasis are always depicted as being low caste, as being pretty much useless, and being people who you don't really want to associate with because you're going to waste your life away. And this fascinated me not least because if we look at the 19th century and if we look up to the early 20th century, what we find is these communities, or whatever communities were engulfed in this term Mirasis, played fundamental social, religious, and even political roles in Punjabi society. Religiously, they were fundamental aspects of performance of religious songs, religious music. They were also transmitters of religious stories. Now, this uh, brought them, um, this complicates their situation in, in modern conception of religion because they transcended religious boundaries. They were used in Sikh ceremonies, Hindu ceremonies, and Muslim ceremonies. Socially, they were, fundament they were very important because you could not have social ceremonies, be they weddings or be they circumcisions, without mirasis being present. But furthermore, the social status, social status of landlords, of um, rulers, etc., were contingent upon the genealogies that were sung or performed by these groups. Um, and this, of course, gives them a political role because they are the keepers of genealogy, they are the keepers of hagiography. Um, they were also entertainers and performers because they were the ones who performed and transmitted folk traditions. But yet, you get this sense of marginalization about them. And this marginalization is what fascinates me. Why is a group that performs such fundamental roles in 19th and early 20th century suddenly written about and almost etched out of history as somebody that, that's a group that's marginal? And this is what I'm particularly interested in. I'll give you two examples of this marginalization. If you look at Sikh, hagiograph Sikh history, what you find is the Sikh gurus, traditionally, if you look further back, the Sikh gurus always had very good friends who were Mirasis. And these were their constant companions. These Mirasis even wrote uh, verses that are in the Sikh holy text. However, Sikh history today doesn't see them as an important fundamental player in the religious tradition at all. In fact, they are portrayed as jesters, they are portrayed as buffoons, who were with the with the Sikh gurus because they kept falling into trouble and the Sikh gurus rescued them and in the process the Sikh gurus um, elucidated some great message for saving the world, etc. So they become marginalized even in those stories. And the, in proverbs as well, there are numerous proverbs in the Punjabi language which talk about Mirasis in a very disparaging way. One, one of which is, uh, goes, Mirasi um, teacher karda ta apni maa which means that when a Mirasi performs as a gesture, he doesn't even spare his mother or his sister in being lewd. Now, which is the, I, the it's epitomized as a person who's shameless and as a character that's a word that's often used in South Asia, characterless. And this marginalization interests me, and I've got one minute, 12 seconds left, so I'm <laughs> gonna sum it up. My tentative conclusions about this process of marginalization are that the Mirasis fell victim to a twin um, impact of the emergence of print technology, which in itself brought a textual tradition or a textualization of folk literature. But print technology also brought about reform movements, religious reform movements, be they Hindu, Muslim, or Sikh in Punjab, which stressed textualized traditions of religion but also traditions of religion which were centered upon fixing communal boundaries between Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs. And the Mirasis being a community that were not textual and flirted from religious traditions, serving all religious traditions, just basically was written out of history. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Iqbal. Um, Chris Tuton from the Department of American Studies will speak on the Gagora rhetoric of Cher the Cherokee stories of the Turtle Island Liars Club. Wow, this has been amazing. <laughs> My mind's abuzz with all these talks. It's been great. Who knows you can get so much done in five to seven minutes. Uh, so today I'm going to speak about um, an outcome of um, of a book project that I completed and published as of uh, October 2012. This book, Cherokee Stories of the Trill Island Liars Club. I'll just pass around you all so you can take a brief look at it, published with UNC Press. Um, but before I get started, let me just tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, I'm, of course, I'm in the American Studies Department, and I teach an American Indian Studies curriculum within that department and a part of the, the folklore faculty as well. And I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, the Cherokee Nation is located in the 14 counties of northeastern Oklahoma. We're the largest Native American nation by population. Anytime you see that we're Cherokee spread around on a golf course or on a uh, vehicle by Jeep, that's our, our tribal name they're co-opting. Um, uh, so it's, it's everywhere. Um, but um, I um, have, throughout my academic career, been involved in the development of indigenous uh, literary criticism and critical theory. So really working um, from the start and trying to develop um, critical terms and concepts that come out of indigenous cultures themselves, rather than simply applying um, Euro-American uh, or European concepts to the study of indigenous cultures. Okay, so that's the moment we're in really within indigenous cultures with, or indigenous studies within uh, North America currently. And for the past 20 or 30 years, scholars have been developing those things. So in my first book, Reasoning Together, the Native Critics Collective, uh, the, um, the whole book was based upon um, a question, and that question was, describe an ethical Native American literary criticism. And we invited a bunch of Native literary scholars to try to answer that question, to try to describe that. And that's been a very, very useful text. My second work, um, Deep Waters, the Textual Continuum in American Indian Literature, was concerned with the relationship between oral and what I call graphic forms of communication as understood within tribally specific indigenous cultural contexts. So rather than applying orality and, um, and literacy as concepts coming out of a, a European tradition, how are those understandings developing within indigenous cultural um, spaces? And what you find within the history of, of that com those systems of communication within uh, North America, and even, of course, in, in, in Mesoamerica as well, that they have their own reasons for, you know, Native, Native cultures have had their own reasons for, for expressing knowledge orally or in graphic forms, whether they be in writing or wampum belts or sand paintings or other forms of communication. So I've done a lot of work like that. Um, but that was kind of the theoretical work that I, what really kept me from one of the areas I really wanted to focus on was that is with uh, studying oral traditions within my own culture, within my own tribe. So, um, so uh, starting about 10 years ago, I started work, working with four elders from my nation who collectively call themselves the Turtle Island Liars Club. And the reason why they call themselves the Liars Club is because there is no word for storyteller within the Cherokee language. It's Galgog, which means liar, right? And they're, of course, there's lots of debate you can have about where that term comes from. Does it come from uh, out of a southeastern tradition in general, thinking about storytellers as liars? Um, you know, does it come from other indigenous forms of understanding with that liar? But what I like about it and what I, what I want to focus on um, in some of my, my future work is to study the way in which that idea of the liar um, plays a certain contingency about knowledge, right? And doesn't, um, like we we'll often think about, once again, within the study of oral tradition, you go back to Walter Ong or other theorists of oral tradition talk about orality being something that reifies knowledge. Well, when you have a term like liar describing those people who are held within a, a, a tradition as being absolutely central to that tradition, but nevertheless con, you know, making truth contingent, you can show that, no, it's not reified knowledge. It's about a process. It's about processual understanding of the world in which storytelling has a function within that, concept, that, that, that construct. So. Um, so this was my, I like to think of the work I do in terms of praxis, where there's theory and practice. Of course, they're always intermeshed, but doing work within my home community was that practical element that I really wanted to do. So I ended up working over, over um, the past 10 years with this group of, of storytellers. And um, after lots of discussion and um, lots of false starts and, and kind of pondering things, we decided to publish a book together. So over several years, we recorded a bunch of stories. Uh, and conversations and their interviews. And that's the outcome is this book, Cherokee Stories of the Turtle Island Liars Club. Um, so it's the first book of um, Cherokee storytelling, traditional Cher Cherokee storytelling published with, with, um, with storytellers who are recognized by, with, as storytellers within the tribal context and published in 40 years. 
and um, include stories, interviews, teachings, what are called teachings within the, um, the context of the Liars Club, and um, stories of both the ancient past, myths, you know, but also really funny humor stories that are of the present, and that's what they really wanted to focus on that. So that work was great, and it was, it was wonderful to take part in it, but it was a, a work that was done very collaboratively. So the, the, the point of it all was to share these stories with Cherokee community and with a wider public. But of course, it kept me from doing that kind of that analytical work that as a scholar I want to do. So this is a work that's nothing like Keith Basso's Wisdom Sits in Places or Julie Cruikshank's work or other scholars of morality who, who are really analyzing it. I had to kind of you know, wear a different hat when I published this work. And so I had to set aside those questions that I had about what was actually going on behind the scenes um, and what were some of the, the deeper ideas in a more kind of analytical or critical framework. And so um, this work um, it responds to that. The, the next kind of, the next leg of the, this journey for me is to think about some of these ideas. And so I, I've been um, pondering this question of Galgog rhetoric, you know, the way in which I understand Galgog as a certain kind of rhetoric. So I have a minute left. <laughs> uh, well, what's interesting about this, the, this telling lies, is like I said, it, um, um, is that Storytelling works, one of the functions of storytelling works um, as a way of um, thinking about the present. So while we talk about, for example, stories about monsters, in the context of sitting with my elders, some people will talk about some of these old Cherokee monsters like Stone Coat, right, or uh, Spearfinger, some of these monsters that lived up in the, the mountains of North Carolina. And people say, we still have those monsters today, alcoholism, diabetes, right? There's ways in which we talk about those stories and we can relate to those stories but we add a kind of a modern veneer, and they become important, and they stay, stay and remain important within the community. And what I came to find out is that these stories uh, are not ends in themselves, but they're means of keeping the community strong. And that's what this, this whole group, this Liars Club, is not just a group of storytellers, but what's called within the Cherokee context a skadug, or a community that comes together to mutually support each other. So listeners and storytellers are all part of that community, all mutually supportive. And, um, and that's what I'm researching currently. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And our, our final speaker already, our final speaker is Susan Harbage Page from the Department of Women's and Gender Studies, and she will speak on US Mexico border pro US Mexico border project recent art interventions. And Maria, thank you, and Brian, thank you so much for your help with all of this. Um, and that's way too big, it needs to come down, size down. There we go, okay, great. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Maria and Brian, again. So, um, I'm an artist, and I work in women's and gender studies, and that's me when I was six. I just thought I'd let you know how long I've been making art. Um, that's my first brown camera, so I've been sort of looking back and asking questions and documenting the world for a really long time. I have been thinking about the physical and the psychological space of the U.S.-Mexico border since 2007, and I worked down on the right near Matamoros, Mexico and Brownsville, Texas. This is what the river and the Rio Grande and the border looks there, like there, and um, I would think that everybody in this room could swim north across that river. And what happens in this area is you swim across, you take off your wet clothes, put on dry clothes, and come on into the United States and create a, a new and uncertain future for yourself. It's a man's argyle sock. This is a woman's eyeshadow found right on the banks of the river. And it always makes me think about one of the things that moved me to start this work. And that was um, a story I heard on NPR that 20% more women and children die um, crossing the border and coming north into the United States. This is one of the most powerful objects I've found. It's um, the identification papers, the passport, the driver's license, the birth certificate of Alex Ramirez Cuba, who was 19 and had come all the way north from Honduras. And he ditched it so he wouldn't get sent back to Honduras if he was picked up by the Border Patrol, but um, to Mexico. It was wet when I found it. 
After I photograph the objects on site, I ship them back to my studio and I re-photograph them and put them in an anti-archive. It's really important to me that, for example, this shirt I keep folded just the way I found it. This is a toothbrush. It's such a personal object, but it's also seen as a weapon by the U.S. Border Patrol. And in 2009, um, I started thinking about site-specific interventions and place, and um, I did this project. It's called Crossing Over, a Floating Intervention. And it's underneath the Gateway International Bridge between Matamoros and um, Brownsville, Texas. And um, you're looking north into the United States. You can see the Border Patrol car there on the left of that car. So I worked with a group of artists from the United States and Mexico to, to put this into place. And my favorite thing about this intervention is every, every single one of those inner tubes is filled with the breath of a different person. Mm -hmm. I also made a welcome station. I think everybody should be welcomed into the United States. And it was complete with the um, swimming, running, and canoeing trophies that, that we all gave out. They say, welcome to the United States in Spanish. There's our welcome station right underneath the official um, border, which is one of the most cross borders in the world. The following year, I made this giant wreath. It's made out of local materials, local processes. In fact, somebody in the store right on the border taught me how to make these fabulous ribbons. I put it together. It's based on a found wreath from a, a cemetery nearby, and I carried it out to the border and put it up on the border fence and just left it there. It really is a reference to loss, the loss of lives that take place on the border, the loss of community, the division of families, loss of commerce, culture, language, knowledge. It also became a target. And this is looking into Mexico from the US border. And when I'm on the border, I often ask people to walk with me. And um, they always say to me after they've walked along the border, you know, I'll never see it the same way. I used to just think it was trash. I'll never see these objects in a like way. Um, so I wanted to make that more present for other people who might not have the chance to walk with me. So I left the objects that year on site and took a protective um, circle of blue chalk, and I just drew a protective circle of blue chalk around all the objects and left them in the landscape. And this October, I was invited to do a talk at a conference on the inner German border in Hanover, Germany, and it was really, really interesting. I discovered these photographs that um, apparently are very common. They're photographs of East German soldiers, soldiers taken by people from the West. And as I understand it, if you were an East German soldier and someone was making your photograph, you were taught to pick up your camera and, and either deflect, you know, disguise, hide, or mirror the gaze of whoever was looking at you and making your photograph. So I was thinking about that, and when I went to the border this year, I went to Nuevo Progreso and went to the middle of that bridge, and right on the boundary line between the two countries, I put up these two mirrors, sort of asking you know, people to look and say, where do you fit in? Who makes that decision? How do you see yourself? The other thing I thought about at that conference was, who makes all these decisions about borders? How do they come to be? It's usually a group of privileged people in a room someplace far away from the actual border looking at a map. And so I was thinking about humanizing the border. So I just laid down in the middle of the bridge and became the border. Um, eventually I was chased away by the, by the border guards. I was okay as long as I did it in Mexico, but when I got right on the border in the United States, I got chased away. That's my point of view. <laughs> and this is the same idea, just a different part of the border.
And I often think about um, Alex, because that, that wallet was so powerful when I found it. It was wet. And I often think about how he had to throw his ID away to stay in that space of the border. But I use my privilege, and often I pull out my USC ID to stay on the border, because I'm very often stopped by the Border Patrol. And one day, I just threw my wallet and my passport and my change down on the ground, just like Alex had done. And I have to tell you, it was terrifying. I felt so vulnerable, even though I really was in control of the situation. And the last project um, that I did was my mother's teacups. I carried my mother's bone china teacups, which she carried back from England, where my ancestors are from, to the border. So they went from England to Ohio. When she migrated south to North Carolina, she brought them to North Carolina. I took them to the border. And I really wanted to think about and um, draw attention to the idea that almost all of us here are immigrants. And that's my last image. Thank you so much. Thank you.